Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, these days, Germany is extremely well represented on the international art scene. And one of the figureheads here in the fields of painting and sculpture for several decades now is our guest today. So without any further ado, let me introduce you to Markus Lupertz. Mr. Lupertz, thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> it's for my pleasure. <laughs> Art critics, they like to put people like you into boxes. And on the box, they write a label. Mm -hmm. And the box they put you in has got written on it neo-expressionism, mm -hmm. what Germans like to call neo-expressionismus. Mm -hmm. Is it the right box for you? <laughs> no, it's not really a box, but simply a way of describing something new. A tag that was used to describe certain painters, myself among them. People clearly needed an association with something that predated the war, because before that we'd had 12 years of Nazism, so this was a way of connecting to the great German art of the pre-war period, so to speak. And as always, the media needs a concept, and this was neo-expressionism, because the connection seemed obvious. Our painting style was very intense. It was very aggressive in a certain sense. And as regards its subject matter, it was sometimes vulgar or coarse, military, grotesque, insane and hot-headed. All of those are characteristics of expressionist art. But our art had nothing to do with expressionism, because expressionism encapsulated a totally different approach to life. Expressionism was a product of the 1920s. It was more sophisticated. Okay, 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 okay. okay. You're not an expressionist. You're not a neo-expressionist. No, no. What, what are you? I'm, uh, I'm a painter of my century. This is my time. Are you a European artist? Are you a European artist? Actually, I'd say I'm a German painter. That's very important. What's a German artist? Visual arts can't be international. And it's still too early to describe Europe as having a nationality of its own. As a consequence, I'm still completely bound up in the German painting tradition. Painting is always national, it's always territorial, it always has something to do with the sun that shines in this particular place or the shade in this corner. It's always defined by a place where the artist happens to be. It has a highly territorial connection, it's subnational, and to popularize the artist's perception on an international level is a question of timing and luck. I told the audience that you were a boxer, that you're a bit of a pugilist. Um, we saw it in that report. Let's go back in time. Let's go back to the year that you were born in, to 1941. Right. You've mentioned history already. We heard about history in that report. Um, Germany was in ruins when you were a young boy. Can you remember that? Well, I was born a Czech national. And my family fled after the war. You were a Czech citizen. Mm -hmm. We traveled through Saxony and we ended up in the Ruhr region. My father was arrested and we were put in a camp. And then I spent a year in the camp and became German. And after that I was released and went to stay with my grandmother in the Ruhr. My father came later, the rest of the family came later, and we all moved to München Gladbach, to Reit. I can remember the escape. The memories are not necessarily complex, but certain images and visions do come back to me. And the memories are not actually bad ones. Not even of the worst things, even the bombs, the attack on the tracks by low-flying bombers. So either I had a happy childhood or I was too stupid to understand that it was dangerous. It really didn't affect me in any way. On the contrary, it was like a big adventure. And from your very early days, if I understand correctly, you wanted to be an artist. Why? Why? Yeah, why? Why? Well, I can't answer that question. 
Yes, yes, I always wanted to be an artist, all my life. Mm -hmm. A painter. You knew painting from the very early days? From the very early days, yes. Uh -huh. Tell me about painting. Painting, thousands of years ago, you had cavemen painting on the walls of their caves, animals or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thousands of years later, now, painting is relevant. Why? Why is it still relevant? You've got a, you've got a mobile phone in your pocket where you could take a photo. Snap, snap. Why painting? Well, painting is a discipline. People would like to abolish painting altogether because photography is easier to understand. Photography and painting have nothing in common. Painting is a discipline in itself that can potentially wither and die if it's no longer being appreciated because people no longer have the imagination to form any kind of opinion about something abstract. And even if it's figurative, one can only understand painting through its abstractions and derive any sensuality from it. What does abstract mean there? What does that mean? If something is abstract, it's not at home in reality, but it is at home in painting. If something is invented by the process of painting itself, it begins with the surface of the painting, with the material, the paint, it begins with the material canvas. It's a discipline that has existed for centuries and millennia, which is due to its longevity, attained a divine, enormous significance. It can't be abolished, but people can suddenly find they cannot access it if educational levels continue to fall. When you consider the effect of modern age influences such as the television or computer, things that bring people so close to reality that they no longer possess the ability to appreciate forms that diverge from reality, then they might soon no longer be able to appreciate a free form just as perceptively as they would a photograph of a tree. This ability, which we've trained with the invention of abstraction, has opened up a huge universe of forms, colors, abstract elements and individual responsibility for our ideas. Okay, let's, you've, talked about, you've talked about painting being a divine form. We've talked about history. Here's a quick one, a quick question. Art is power. Comment. Quick. Spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> there is something seductive about power, and if you utilize it, art is a kind of power. That's absolutely right. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's talk about it in just a minute. Uh, the reason why I'm asking this probing question is that one of the leading museums here in the, the German capital, Berlin, is the German Historical Museum. It's currently staging an exhibition called Displaying Power, Art as a Strategy of Rule. Let's take a closer look at what it's all about before we continue talking about power and the exhibition itself. Former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder is a well-known art lover, as is current Foreign Minister Guido Westerwelle. But what is it about people in power and art? Modern art is associated with risk-taking, decisiveness, power. It's dynamic, progressive and forward-looking. These are exactly the sort of qualities you find listed as prerequisites for jobs in management. In politics, art has replaced the sort of symbols of power that have been out of favor since the Nazi era. When West Germany's government was in Bonn, neutral historical paintings were chosen to grace the modest-looking chancellery offices. After unification, attitudes changed. When Gerhard Schröder assumed office, he chose Georg Baselitz's painting of the German eagle as a swooping vulture. He probably saw himself as belonging to the 1968 protest generation with a critical and distant relationship to the state, so a painting mocking a symbol of state seemed quite fitting. Angela Merkel has typically conservative taste. West Germany's first chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, looks over her shoulder. She doesn't use modern art to magnify her position and boost her image. But in a way, this can work to her advantage. You get the feeling that this is a person who doesn't need something exclusive like modern art to represent the extent of her power. 
Guido Vestavella has nurtured a reputation as an art connoisseur and collector. His unconventional taste is perhaps something to impress international visitors. For big business, big art has long been a vital part of their corporate image. As decoration or status symbol, art has always had to maintain a special relationship with commerce. And artists have, for centuries, appreciated the patronage of rich and powerful friends. Rich and powerful friends may be also politically influential friends. You have done portraits of uh, Gerhard Schroeder yeah, and Helmut Kohl, Kohl, two former German chancellors. What was the difference? In the personalities and, uh, in and the my relationship to both men. My friendship uh, with Gerhard Schroeder goes very deep. And I only got to know and appreciate Helmut Kohl personally when he came for the sitting. They are both men who, uh, who are very attracted by power. Clearly politicians always are, but these two. Power is very important in their lives. I do have a certain penchant for that, but that's something I've gotten well under control. And, well, power and force are things that are not without a certain sensual appeal. If you've got them, that's good. But as a painter, you don't necessarily. Tell, tell me more about this. You, you've used the German word. The German word is a very strong word. Gewalt, violence. Gewalt, yeah. Twice, three times already. You, you've had you've 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 had boxing matches with your critics. Well, let's say I had a tough time of it as a youth. There was a lot of violence. I was in the Foreign Legion, a place where there's a great deal of violence. There's plenty of violence on the street. There was plenty of violence after the war. I'm no stranger to it. I used to work as a bouncer at a Berlin bar. I'm familiar with this sort of violence, but thank God I've got it under control. But you find it attractive? Yes, sure, there was some pleasure to be derived from the altercations. It's not that one was always on the receiving end of it. There was a certain amount of pleasure to be had from these disagreements, and it showed that every young person clearly needs to clash with others to a certain degree. Okay, so you find, you find Gewalt, violence, to an extent attractive. What do you find more attractive? Do you find ugliness more attractive or beauty more attractive? I'm fundamentally an exponent of beauty. You can also approach beauty via ugliness. This throws up many possibilities. An ideal is always beautiful, but defining it as beautiful is an individual decision. What's beautiful for one person is ugly for another. So I'm not commercially bound to a beauty ideal. I have my own ideas about what is enchanting. Okay, that was, that, that was beauty. Let's go, let's go back to violence. You, you grew up in a family that was uh, in the Protestant, German Protestant church? Uh, no, my father was Catholic, my mother Protestant, but that's why we were baptized in the Protestant church. You've joined the Catholic church. Is the Catholic church a violent church? Alle. All organizations that operate in the intellectual sphere that nourish the intellect or are at home in intellectual fields have force at their disposal. And life requires a certain amount of force. The force doesn't always have to be evil. The good guys also need force to achieve their aims. And the church is particularly obliged to maintain this force that it possesses, or this influence that it has, at a level that ensures it remains pure and positive. And this is why we're now seeing this problem with the church. They saw it as giving them the right to apply force. Now they've foregone this right. They can no longer impart faith because they've shown that they themselves are no longer faithful, because they have betrayed their own principles. Well, the, the, it's a very difficult scan, scandal that's in, inside the Catholic Church and it's still going on. What have, what have you learned as a result of this scandal? What's your conclusion? Well, as a Catholic, of course, I have a huge problem with it. 
because I'm shocked at how little faith the protagonists of this religion have in God, and how lightly they pass up the chance of bliss and eternal life by committing such an obvious sin, an act that is also described as sin in their religion, how they throw themselves away, their entire capacity to believe and give up their profundity and their credibility. Let's talk about let's talk about you a little bit more. I mean, I mean, you said one time, I think I, I read something that um, you <clears throat> you say artists should not moralize. They should not go out there with a big moral statement and and, and express it up front in their art. Do you say that? Do you have morals? What? Do you have morals? Are you a moral person? Are you a person who has morals? Are you moral? moral ah, so, sure, yes, I understand. Yeah, yes. Sure, I sure of course I have a moral code. I've always tried not to be miserly. I've always tried to be generous. I've always tried to be honest. I've always tried never to deceive anyone or take advantage of anyone. So you're a real, a real Christian? A real Christian. But in my view, that's also a very humanist approach. I try and get on with people, not to go behind anyone's back or deceive anyone. These are efforts I value very highly. Have you had a personal crisis because of the crisis in the church? I think the problem is that unsuitable people are entering this profession, clearly because they view it as a profession and not as a calling. If you follow a calling in life, then you'd be much more afraid of God. If you have a problem of this nature, a tendency to weaken when among young people, then you just have to go. Staying put to satisfy human urges of this kind in such an easy way, that's just not acceptable. Religion is allowed to do anything but break its own rules because it becomes vulnerable, it becomes secular. And when it moves into the secular realm, Along comes the police officer and arrests the priest. That's not good for the church, it's not for God, and it's not good for the faithful. Okay, let's move on to something on a little bit of a lighter note. We're moving a little bit towards the end of the program. I'd like to ask you, I know that you're, you're, you're a sports fanatic. You grew up with sport, you grew up playing soccer. I know that soccer is something that you love, you adore, yeah? yeah? Uh, racing. Yes, I like wrestling and boxing. Wrestling and boxing. And I used to play soccer. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about football. Is Germany better at art or better at football? It's better at art at the moment, no question. Art is certainly ahead at the moment. It has a completely different quality, as well as a quite different level of international respect and recognition. I don't know what's wrong with German football right now. I think there's no such thing as German football anymore. I can see a European soccer style developing, though. And I believe that German footballers have already surrendered all the characteristics that might have been described as German. Soccer players today try and play an international game, one that's heavily inspired by South America, with features that are not in evidence in Germany. And the Germans are struggling to keep up. They simply can't do it. It doesn't suit them. This fluid, choreographed style is just too much of a rarity in Germany. The Germans have always played a very physical game, and now they're running into trouble. Let's finish up with our quiz, Talking Germany quiz. Yeah, Some quick questions. Painting or sculpture? Beides. Both. Ugliness or beauty? Die beauty. Abstract art or figurative art? You do a bit of both. Beides. Both. Success or failure? <laughs> oh, this is really hard. Both. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, art or soccer? Okay, I suppose I have to say art, but I wouldn't want to give up soccer. Ich will den Fußball nicht so rauslassen. We've been talking here on Talking Germany to the artist and football fan Markus Lupertz. I hope you've enjoyed his company as much as I have. He's been an excellent guest. Come back next week. Just.